Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the New Books Network. I'm your host, Tom DeSena, from the Department of Communication, Journalism, and Public Relations at Oakland University. My guest today is Simon Truant, the author of Kassirer and Heidegger in Davos, The Philosophical Arguments. The 1929 encounter between Ernst Cassirer and Martin Heidegger in Davos, Switzerland, is considered one of the most important intellectual debates of the 20th century and a founding moment of con- continental philosophy. At the same time, many commentators have questioned the philosophical profundity and coherence of the actual debate. In this book, the first comprehensive philosophical study of the Davos debate, Simon Truant challenges these critiques. He argues that Kassirer and Heidegger's disagreement about the meaning of Kant's philosophy is motivated by their different views about the human condition, which in turn are motivated by their opposing conceptions of what the task of philosophy ultimately should be. Truant shows that Kassirer and Heidegger share a grand philosophical concern to comprehend and aid the human being's capacity to orient itself in and towards the world. Simon Truant is FWO postdoctoral fellow at KU Leuven. He is the editor of Interpreting Kassirer, Critical Essays, and has published articles in journals including Idealistic Studies and the International Journal of Philosophical Studies. Simon Truant, welcome to the New Books Network. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Tom, for having me. This is very exciting. Um, so I typically like to start these interviews by asking an off- author what brings them to this particular project. And and I think we're going to get to that question, but I want to get to it by asking a somewhat different question, which is, what was the Davos Disputation and what accounts for its enduring fascination even now, almost 100 years after it took place? Yeah, uh, the Davos debate... Um, as it's uh, very often called, is a debate between Ernst Cassir and Martin Heidegger. But it was a afternoon of a much longer gathering in Davos, in the Swiss Alps town. Um, in 1929, from March 17 until April 6, so three weeks, there was an international or internationale Davoser Hochschulkurse that was going on, something like a summer school. And in 1929, it was the second time that this took place. Uh, The year before, it was the first time that a few French and uh, German organizers had uh, organized this this summer school with the intent of bringing together, reuniting, actually, French and German thinkers. And this was motivated by the fact that in 1928... Um, So in between the two world wars, there was a time of cultural crisis, a time of intellectual crisis, and a lack of cross-fertilization between thinkers from these uh, different countries, which obviously uh, was a result of the First World War. And so the Davos Hochschulkurse um, was aiming to overcome this. And the second, the first edition had been a success, but for the second one, they really wanted to go big and they managed to attract two very important thinkers at uh, that moment. So on the one hand, you have Ernst Cassirer, who was one of the most renowned German intellectuals at the beginning of the 20th century. He was known uh, as a great historian of philosophy but also as a spokesman of neo-Kantianism, which one of which was one of the most important philosophical schools at that time. And on the other hand, there's Martin Heidegger, who only two years earlier in 1927 had published Being in Time, which had caused um, a lot of, uh, well, a lot of enthusiasm within uh, the philosophical communities um, because of the groundbreaking work that uh, it clearly uh, was and has remained to be. So these two thinkers were brought together in this setting and there were a lot of other people present uh, that we now know as well. So Immanuel Levinas was there, Rudolf Carnap was there, Eugen Fink, Leon Brunschvig, Herbert Marcuse. So these are all people who uh, in their own regard would become rather famous afterwards. They were attending as younger uh, students or, or doctoral students or colleagues. 
And the format was such that first there was a series of independent lectures. Um, Heidegger did four hours of lectures. Kassir did four hours of lectures. And then that was supposed to culminate into this debate, which took place on April 2nd, 1929. There are a lot of fun anecdotes about this uh, three-week course. As you can imagine, Heidegger would every now and then show up in his uh, ski suit um, because he loved skiing and also did not care about uh, academic um, etiquette. Uh, on the other hand, Kassir got ill for a while uh, during this um, this summer school. Let's let's keep calling it. Um, and Heidegger would ha- would come uh, to his uh, to his room um, in this um, Hotel Belvedere, which is a, a spa resort, um, and would inform him about what uh, his lectures had been about. So there's already a build up for uh, a few weeks through these independent lectures. And that buildup was not just eh, because it took a while before the, the, the big culmination point of the Davoser Hochschule course that took place, but also because both thinkers were already setting the stage by the topics that they choose for their lectures. Kassir um, would position his own philosophy of culture with regard to philosophical anthropology and Lebensphilosophie. Um, and also with regard uh, to Heidegger. And this is something that he otherwise rarely did because he um, had, at that point, I think there were not any um, publications by him which engaged engaged with uh, those contemporary uh, currents. On the other hand, Heidegger, uh, for the first time publicly, I think, presented his uh, very original, also very controversial, uh, interpretation of, of Immanuel Kant's work, uh, an interpretation that was based on his own being in time. But in doing so, he entered the domain of Kant's studies, which is what Kassir was uh, famous for. So Kassir and Heidegger were sort of entering each other's domain and already uh, setting up uh, the stage a little bit. So I think uh, that's um, what you need to know about uh, the events of what led up to this uh, Davos debate, which was then the public debate attended by all these uh, younger thinkers uh, who I mentioned, um, which must have lasted for a couple of hours uh, between uh, Kassir and Heidegger. So, so then let me ask the, the question. So what, what brings you to this project? What brought me to this project is, um, very simply put, the fact that um, there's this legendary debate it has been commented upon uh, for decades, which almost everyone who comments on it seems to agree that it has had a very big impact on um, the continuation of the history of Western philosophy. There are two famous books. Um, One is about 10 years uh, old. The other one is about 20 years old, uh, who have done this uh, and who have have presented the Davos debate in such a way. There is, on the one hand, there's Michael Friedman's uh, Parting of the Ways, which has presented this Davos debate as the last moment uh, before uh, the split between continental and analytic philosophy uh, really uh, broke through and presents Kassir as the last figure who could have uh, stopped this this parting of the ways, this rupture uh, between two philosophical styles and currents. Um, And then there's also um, Peter Gordon's book, uh, Continental Divide, who also presents this as um, a book, as an event, sorry, a divorce as an event um, that really shaped mainly through how it has been remembered uh, by later philosophers as an event that has really shaped uh, the self-image of um, contemporary philosophy. And so I'm very intrigued by the fact, on the one hand, that everyone, both present and later commenting on it, really really stresses how important this debate, this event has been for the further history of philosophy. And then at the same time, almost all of them claim that the debate itself was disappointing, that it was not a philosophically profound debate, or even that it was no debate at all. 
And some of the um, eyewitnesses already report this. Uh, Leo Strauss does this, for example, but also some of the news uh, journalists from newspapers who were present there. They report that the debate was basically two people talking in different languages, using different discourse, having different uh, motivations for doing philosophy, and really just talking past each other, not really engaging with each other. This is something that Heidegger also lamented. And so this seeming contradiction is, I think, um, the main reason that I got so interested in uh, this debate. There are other uh, reasons. I mean, the fact that the uh, the philosophy of Immanuel Kant is one of the main topics. Um, that's what initially uh, drew me into it because uh, Immanuel Kant was the first philosopher that I engaged with as uh, as a student. Um, and then I got intrigued by this this figure, uh, Ernst Cassir, who reportedly uh, was one of the main one of the most influential philosophers at the beginning of the 20th century, and now has been very much forgotten. And the fact that uh, Heidegger uh, seemed uh, to have won the debate um, has played a very large role in why Kassir has been forgotten. So I got into this um, because there seemed to be a lot of angles to this debate. Um, and I really wanted to re-examine whether indeed it was an actual philosophical debate or not. My answer, of course, is that it was. And that is what uh, my whole book tries to uh, tries to explain. And, and it does that brilliantly because, as you say, there's there's typically kind of two responses that um, people have to the Davos debate, and and one is to read it sort of symbolically um, to to look at um, look at the event uh, and and almost push the philosophical uh, ideas to the background. Um, and then the other is to say that, you know, th essentially these two people are, are kind of just talking past one another, that, that there's, there's, no, there's no debate here at all. And, and the really terrific thing about your book is that it kind of puts these two people back into the room together and, and looks at the points where they're, they're talking and they're disagreeing about some really fundamental issues. The first of these, as you point out, is the, the, their disagreement about the proper interpretation of Kant. So uh, I wonder if you might want to start there and, and talk about um, really both how they're, they are speaking the same language, um, but they're really disagreeing about some fundamental issues. Yeah. Um, so indeed, this is the point where they really seem to s still speak the same language. Of course, they already have some disagreements, but this is the first issue that's uh, being brought up. So that is, according to me, also uh, the first of three key uh, topics of the of the debate, structural key topics of the debate. And here they really seem to see uh, eye to eye, at least on one fundamental issue, and that is the importance of uh, the faculty of transcendental imagination in Kant's philosophy. And in that regard, they are both trendsetters, because before that, uh, there, was, uh, there were more empirical readings of uh, Kant's philosophy, there were more uh, intellectualist readings of Kant's philosophy, of course, these readings still exist, but there was a lot of emphasis on this uh, duality of uh, the two stems of human uh, understanding or human knowledge, which is sensibility on the one hand and the understanding on the other hand. And then there would be a debate about which one of these uh, stems is uh, either more fundamental uh, or um, even the only one that really counts, either according to Kant or what we should do with Kant's philosophy. And both Heidegger and Kassir, but they seem to do this completely independently uh, from each other, is to point out these very important passages in, the first, in Kant's first critique about the uh, power of transcendental imagination, which connects uh, sensibility and understanding. And it had usually been understood that it connects them, um, let's say, uh, afterwards, that first you have the stems of sensibility and understanding, and then they are being joined 
true transcendental imagination. But Kassir and Heidegger argue that transcendental imagination is what comes first and that sensibility and understanding um, are um, derived from that or are uh, dependent on that more fundamental power. And so they agree on this, and and that's um, that's already that that's a very important thing. But then, of course, in the end, they will still go on to uh, disagree on, um, given the uh, priority of transcendental imagination, yet whether its sensible or receptive side or its uh, intelligible or its spontaneous side is the one that's most dominant or is the one that's most important. So in the end, they will still part ways um, on a topic that that had divided Kant scholars before, but the very acknowledgement of the, the primacy of transcendental imagination so that at the very basis of our human experience, the very first time the very instant that we sense something or intuit something or understand something, that there is always and a receptive and a an, uh, spontaneous moment, that there's always a sensual and an intelligible moment. That's what uh, brings them together here. And that is something that actually is very shortly discussed um, in the Davos debate, yet has uh, sparked a lot of commentaries and has also caused a lot of interest for um, for uh, Heidegger, Heidegger's further uh, writings on Kant. Uh, unfortunately, less so for Kassir's uh, writings on Kant, but that is also then one thing that in my book I try to um, um, uh, remedy a little bit, yes. So, so let's tease that out a little bit. Um, where do you see, um, in terms of the transcendental imagination, the points of intersection and, diver- and divergence? In uh, Kassir and Heidegger, you mean? Yes. Uh, so Kassir has this new notion of symbolic imagination because he um, has this philosophy of symbolic forms. And the symbolic forms are say, the transcendental um, preconditions for what we would call cultural domains, science, religion, politics, language, uh, economics, and so forth. And in a Kantian fashion, Kassir says that each one of these cultural domains is only possible because there are certain transcendental conditions, eh, certain transcendental principles and transcendental notions that are grounded in the human uh, subject, in human subjectivity, that allow us to construct these realms of cultural meaning. And within these realms of cultural meaning, there are formative symbols, in the same way that for Kant, within uh, our understanding of uh, the natural world, there are um, the, the categories of the understanding that are formative. For Kassir, these are symbols, and he uh, lists Uh, time, space, causality, self, and so on. And the point that, or one of the, one of the founding points of, of Kassir's philosophy of symbolic forms, which is a philosophy of culture, is that in each symbolic form, so in each cultural domain, there is a notion of causality that plays a role. There is a notion of time that plays a role. There is a notion of space that plays a constitutive role. So there is such a thing as um, religious space. A church is a religious, uh, religiously defined location or space. There is such a thing as political space. Uh, could be a nation. Uh, could be a parliament that has that is a space that has a particular political symbolic meaning. There is uh, a notion of scientific space, of course, um, which could be that of. Um, Uh, the universe, or could be that of the space that is occupied by a certain atom. So in each of these cultural domains, we rely on uh, certain symbols, space, but they take on a different meaning in each uh, domain. And Kassir explains this by saying that the way that we perceive and understand the world is through symbolic imagination. So the very moment that we see something we already symbolically interpret it. Uh, 
We don't first see a certain space and then next reflect on it and then intelligibly understand it as either a political space or a religious space or um, uh, or um, yeah or a scientific space um, maybe a simpler example is if you see two lines that intersect we immediately either interpret it as a plus sign when we are thinking uh, scientifically or we interpret it and understand it as a crucifix when we are thinking in a uh, religious manner. And so we do this right away. We don't first see or perceive two intersecting lines and then reflect on uh, the meaning that we want to ascribe to it. No, from the very first moment, we uh, our sensible uh, intuitions are, as Kassir calls it, pregnant with symbolic intelligible meaning. Heidegger has um, in a very described in a very uh, different manner has the same basic point in being in time in his um, uh, existential uh, analytic of Dasein, in which he explains that we as Dasein are always there in the world, and that means that we always already have an um, intelligible understanding of our surroundings. We don't first see a material object, but we immediately understand it as something that is useful for us. For example, as a hammer. And when we understand it as a hammer, we immediately also understand it as referring to the nails that we also have, or to the table that needs to be fixed. And that table, in turn, we immediately understand as um, the table that we use to hold a dinner party or to sit with our family. And Heidegger's, um, one of the basic ideas of Heidegger's philosophy as well, is that so we don't first see some, ob some object that has nothing to do with us, that is unrelated to us, that doesn't have any uh, meaning in itself. We immediately perceive it as meaningfully referring to other beings the hammer to the nails to the table and so on, and also immediately referring in a meaningful way to us, namely as someone who wants to assemble um, a, um, a table or who wants to hold a dinner party. So the way in which it is described is extremely, is, is very different, um, but they both have this basic idea that human perception, be it as a symbolic animal, as Kassir calls it, or as a Dasein, as Heidegger calls it, is um, from the very, um, from the, in, in essence, um, both um, uh, sensitive and uh, intelligent. So that gets us to sort of the, the second theme that you identify, which is um, the very different ideas that Kassir and Heidegger have uh, concerning the human condition. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, what, what are the points of, again, and your book is so brilliant because it identifies both the points of intersection and the points of divergence between these two. But let's talk a little bit about how Kassir and Heidegger look at the human condition. Yeah, thanks. Um, so here we see the the first transition point uh, the, or the first big transition point in the Davos debate um, because despite everything I just said, um, at one point, Kassir still wants to emphasize the intelligible nature or the spontaneous character of our symbolic perception and Heidegger still wants to emphasize the uh, receptive nature um, of Dasein's um, interaction and involvement in the world. Eh? So despite them first emphasizing that there's no duality at the basis, that there is um, that these, these two aspects of receptivity and spontaneity are two sides of the same coin, then yet they want to emphasize either one side. And what I try to show in my book is that that's not really motivated by how they understood Kant, or that's not really motivated by by what Kant writes, because yeah, 
there, you can you um, I mean Kant's Kant's writings on on these uh, on these matters are are very complex and they uh, they start uh, picking the quotes that uh, that that they really like. <laughs> Um, what really motivates them is a much larger picture of what the human condition is. And it's that idea of what the human condition is that actually motivates their understanding of Kant. And there you see, um, well, some of the same things. Eh? You see on a much larger, uh, on a larger level, uh, they uh, emphasize that the human condition has an aspect of finitude uh, and then of uh, infinity at the same time. But Kassir really emphasizes the uh, inf infinite nature of our symbolic imagination because what he really is interested in is how we are capable uh, of producing all this cultural meaning. All this cultural meaning, politics, science, religion, mythology, uh, all these things that do not exist in nature, that are uh, brought forth by human subjectivity, and that also, with regard to the individual level, will endure um, past our uh, own uh, existence. Heidegger, on the other hand, he really emphasizes the finite nature of Dasein. Dasein is fundamentally characterized by temporality. Um, its being in the world is also fundamentally characterized uh, by being thrown into the world, into a world that already uh, exists in a meaningful way, uh, before we arrive, because the way in which we interpret the hammer, in which we interpret uh, dinner parties, uh, in which we interpret ourselves uh, especially, um, are all embedded within uh, a world that already pre-exists and in which we are thrown and need to find uh, our place. Um, and so when it comes to the human condition, again, you can, you can see to a certain extent the same view of, of a split being, of a dual being, um, not a dualistic being, but a dual being, uh, but then a different emphasis on what is the most fundamental uh, characteristic of this being. Um, and so for, uh, for Kassir, that's, that's our infinity, uh, our capacity to bring something new into this world. Uh, and for Heidegger, it's more our uh, being thrown into the world and our uh, limits uh, in projecting something uh, meaningful into this world. This episode is brought to you by Direct TV Stream. Direct TV Stream brings you the live TV you love. That means you can stay up to the minute on 24 hour live news, from entertainment to current events, wherever you are in the US, whether that's at home on your TV or streaming on the go. And you get your favorite live sports, so you can catch this season's biggest games. Get the best of live TV with Direct TV Stream. Get your TV together at directtv.com. And so I want to stop or, or pause here and maybe maybe come back uh, a little bit to um, why that distinction is important here and uh, sort of the symbolic value of not symbolic value but the the symbolism that that sort of sometimes uh, obscures our understanding of the philosophy and instead gets us to read the Davos debate somewhat differently through the symbolism um, that is why are these two figures um, so important on a symbolic level for people great question um you see in the reception of the Davos debate that they were so from the very beginning. Um, and it's, I think, but you've, you've pointed this out before, it's, um, it's also what, what has, um, it's also become a flaw, I think, of, of the reception of, of the Davos debate um, in a lot of the literature. Because Kassir and Heidegger, um, as you said it well, they have become sort of symbols uh, for much larger philosophical positions, but also uh, societal positions. And um, if, if you look at the literature about the, the, uh, the, uh, the Davos debate, then you see that they have become sort of paradigms for a number of ideological clashes uh, that marked the 20th century, uh, maybe also 
uh, 21st century, philosophically, but also politically and sociologically. Um, so Heidegger was, uh, sorry, Kassir was a defender of the Weimar Republic. Um, Heidegger, of course, uh, infamously uh, became a defender of the Third Reich. Um, Heidegger was a Jewish cosmopolitan. Uh, sorry, Kassir was a Jewish cosmopolitan, was a Jewish cosmopolitan uh, whereas uh, Heidegger was um, uh, a Catholic uh, and staunch defender of more rural provincialist um, uh, viewpoints. Um, Kassir was a pacifist above all, whereas for Heidegger, his philosophy and probably also his life was about radical thinking and oppositions and fights and struggles. Um, Kassir is a cultural optimist. Uh, whereas Heidegger was um, a pessimist or a fatalist, as uh, Kassir would say. Um, Kassir embodies a lot of the thoughts, uh, modernity, enlightenment thoughts, whereas um, uh, Heidegger has definitely been a big influence on, on postmodern thinking. Um, and at the time of the Davos debate, in almost all of these aspects, well, let's not... Uh, uh, mentioned the Third Reich or Nazism here, let's not include that. But with regard to all of the other um, oppositions that I mentioned here, Heidegger was much more in tune with the zeitgeist. And so he was much more appealing. His thoughts were much more appealing to the younger crowd that was present at Davos. Um, and they unanimously considered him the winner of the debate. And given that these are figures that then themselves would become important philosophers, that has had a, a big and also a lasting impact on how the Davos debate has been understood, but also how Kassir has been, I would say, remembered, but actually, I should say, forgotten. Um, this Enlightenment optimism, belief in rationality, belief in progress, that was all not very uh, popular uh, in the interbellum, um, and has, um, well, has not stood the time, at least for, for a while, over against the more existentialist uh, viewpoints of, of Heidegger. That also makes this revisiting this debate, I think, very interesting in, in current times, uh, because, of course, the debates about uh, the status of rationality, uh, believe in progress uh, are still or, or once again very much alive uh, and and it seems that there's also some dis dissatisfaction with the Heideggerian uh, line of thinking uh, on this so for that reason I think it's very very worthwhile to to revisit Kassir uh, because he's not at all a um, one-dimensional um, or or simple uh, defender of these ideas. He has um, a very interesting notion of rationality. It's it's not a term that he uses a lot. He will talk about uh, symbolic meaning, uh, but it's if we want to call it the notion of rationality, then it's one that's very broad eh? because it's not just about scientific rationality. Politics also is based on a form of rationality. Religion is based on a form of rationality. Language is mythology is. Um, and so, um, also today, it might be uh, more than more than ever uh, since Kassir is dead. Uh, very interesting to uh, to reconsider that. But you're absolutely right in the sense that they have become sort of symbols or or paradigms uh, of um, societal and and uh, philosophical viewpoints. And uh, in both cases, I think there's a lot of interesting nuances that can be made there. Yeah, it's certainly a lot of interesting nuances. Uh, it, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it's it's interesting. I just stumbled across an article, and I'm going to apologize in advance to the author, who identifies um, going through Kassir's papers, which are now becoming published and available, um, a misreading of his final posthumous work, The Myth of the State. Um, which has a really odd. Uh, it, it, for Kassir scholars, it's the myth of the state is always this kind of odd piece, and um, this rereading uh, based on some of his original notes, I think, really complicates our understanding of that work. Um, so, 
Bef- I, would, I guess we should move on to the final piece having to do with your arguments regarding uh, their, again, uh, similar but uh, opposing conceptions of the task of philosophy. Yeah. So um, if I may, um, well, first, very clearly emphasize, so the so my the thesis of my book is that, yes, there was a philosophically rich uh, profound, true dialogue between these two thinkers. Um, there are a number of moments when they do uh, talk past each other, when they didn't exactly maybe understood the other or wanted to make a, another point instead. Uh, this is by no means uh, something that uh, is only typical for this debate. This, of course, happens in a lot of debates. Uh, but I think there is a very there is a, a very clear philosophical threat in the debate. And that's a thread that moves from eh, the topic of of Kant's philosophy and the lasting relevance of Kant's philosophy, then to the human condition, and then now to the third topic of the task of philosophy. And so my claim is, more specifically, that uh, that the Davos debate is ultimately a debate about the task of philosophy, and Kassir and Heidegger's diverging diverging viewpoints on that task is what motivates their different uh, conceptions of the human condition. And it's those different conceptions of the human condition that in turn motivate their uh, diverging reason, uh, readings sorry, uh, of Kant's philosophy. But this is the real topic, I think. This is really where um, they stop seeing eye to eye. Yeah? When... Uh, the first topic on Kant, they actually still agreed for the most part, but then uh, started to diverge. Here, this is where they really clash. And that is not to say that they are just two, um, that they only, that they are two emblems of, of, of uh, two different paradigms, but they do have very different uh, takes on what that is. And those takes are, as I um, indicated, they are tied up with their views of the human condition. So if the human condition is such that what what really makes us human, what really um, makes humanity develop, is the fact that we are capable of uh, transcending our uh, our natural side, and we have this symbolic side through which we create cultural meaning. Then the task of philosophy is to understand this and encourage this. Which means, in other words, that the task of philosophy is to um, achieve self-understanding of the human being and then also to aid the self-realization of the human being and of humanity. And the philosophy of symbolic forms tries to do this by showing this diversity of cultural domains. So uh, shows that uh, it's not just science that makes us um, above uh, other uh, animals, but it's uh, the diver- It's it's both science and language and art. I've uh, been uh, failing to mention that symbolic form and politics uh, and even mythology. And the key is to not see a very strong hierarchy between these different cultural domains, but to accept the plurality. And if we accept the plurality of different symbolic forms, which all have their own which all create their own symbolic world or universe and are not just translatable to each other, uh, then that's how we will have the richest cultural life and how we, um, well, become, well, how we self-realize ourselves the most. So this is the optimistic, uh, cultural optimistic view uh, of uh, the human nature and of human culture that uh, Kassir defends. Heidegger... Um, with his emphasis on the finite nature and the limited nature and the temporal nature of Dasein could not possibly defend such a view. So his philosophy, his early philosophy, I should say, as long as he talks about Dasein, is not so much, I mean, it's not at all about trying to push us further um, into an uh, cultural domain, uh, but it's about 
making us understand our own limitations. So it's not about progress and self-realization, but it's about um, coming to terms with um, the shortcomings of our human condition. And whereas I, uh, whereas I call in line with Kassir himself, uh, Kassir's view on the task of philosophy, of philosophy as a form of enlightenment, I call Heidegger's uh, conception of philosophy, a therapeutic conception of philosophy, in the sense that therapy is not supposed to um, make us uh, get rid of our shortcomings or get rid of our, uh, our finitude, but helps us learn to live with that. And then um, you can see how these different views of the task of philosophy are tied up with different views of society, are tied up with different uh, notions and regimes of politics. Uh, they don't, um, well, need to be tied with very particular um, um, political regimes, of course. Um, I, at least I hope so. Um, but they are fundamentally different views on what uh, philosophy should do, and they are tied with these uh, different notions of the human condition. Yeah, and again, I think that I, I especially appreciated your idea of labeling Heidegger's um, philosophy therapeutic. I thought that was, uh, that's just a brilliant framing. Can I ask how you came to it? Um, so I studied in uh, in Leuven at uh, KU Leuven, and although I uh, never really got into that, we have a strong, or we had a strong, when I was a student, we had a very strong um, tradition in uh, professors who were also um, analysts in the psychoanalytic uh, tradition. Um, well, that's interesting. Yeah, so um, Lacan has uh, visited and spoken at uh, the Institute of Philosophy at Leuven, uh, and there were a number of, uh, of professors for a long time there uh, who were uh, practicing even uh, analysts, or at least were teaching a lot of Lacan. And as far as I understand it, this is um, the Lacanian understanding of what therapy means. Eh? So uh, the more popular understanding in philosophy of, of therapy is, is the Wittgensteinian. That's not the one I mean. I mean the Lacanian in which um, therapy is, is about, um, well, trying to uh, make amends with, uh, with your own shortcomings, uh, trying to live with them. So I borrowed it from there. I think it applies to, uh, to Heidegger in this sense as well. Yeah. And just a, another interesting aside, there's a, in my own field of communication, there uh, I think it's Michael Hyde writes about uh, and uses Heidegger to talk about what he re labels rhetorical physicianship, um, and so I think there's some interesting parallels going on there. Okay, so what does what does it mean, rhetorical physicianship? Uh, the idea that uh, that rhetoric, and again, I'm, I my field is uh, rhetorical studies, uh, has the the responsibility to minister to or to heal um, the world as opposed I, I'm this is a very broad brushstroke. So, um, but it, it essentially to um, attend to minister or, or help to heal wounds as opposed to um, the more conflictual ideas that often get circulated around rhetorical studies. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So, oh, and uh, just as an aside, it's uh, the the piece that I was mentioning before is uh, Chiara. I'm, I'm going to butcher this last name, I'm sure. Botici, yes. Uh, who is afraid of the myth of the state? Um, really terrific piece. Uh, so, um, as we come to the conclusion, um, is there any last few words you'd like to say about the the Davos debate? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, well, maybe, yeah. So last words for here. Um, in the end, once I, I got through these three topics, eh, um, well, let me say two things. So first, um, I mean, this is the philosophical structure that I saw in the debate and that, uh, on my view, renders it a true philosophical dialogue. 
But in order to really see that, uh, you have to weed through other passages in the debate that uh, that that seem tangential or or that maybe are not clearly connected. In order to see that, it helps to look at uh, at two other things, and the first one is the much longer um, Kassir Heidegger dispute, as I call it, which is uh, the collection of all the instances in which Kassir and Heidegger engaged with each other um, through book reviews, uh, through comments and footnotes um, on the other's works. Uh, and that is a, a conversation that started in 1923 already, and that would last um, because uh, not because Heidegger cared anymore, but but because um, Kassir became increasingly worried. That lasted until 1946. So that's the myth of the state, uh, posthumously uh, published, in which uh, Kassir, for the last time and and most uh, firmly uh, of all instances, really criticizes. Um, Heidegger's uh, fatalistic conception of philosophy. So it helps to look at these, all, all these other instances in which they engage to see the same structure, to see the same three topics return, and also with the same um, hierarchically uh, in, hierarchical interrelation. But then what really, I think, supports uh, my claim is that if you look at Kassir's own philosophy, and Heidegger's own early philosophy, that you also see that these are three key topics of their thought that are related to each other in that sense. So Kassir's philosophy, Kassir's writings engage a lot with uh, Immanuel Kant's uh, thoughts, and they they turn or they, um, they develop his uh, critique of reason into a much broader critique of culture. So the whole project of the philosophy of symbolic forms is a continuation of Kant's uh, transcendental and critical philosophy. In doing so, in order to back up this philosophy of culture, he needs to develop a new notion of uh, human subjectivity, which uh, leads to his, um, his very rarely addressed but very important uh, conception of uh, the human being as an animal symbolicum, a symbolic animal. And all of this is, of course, within his uh, philosophy of culture, which, as he uh, grows older, uh, becomes more and more a philosophy that has a, a clear task of uh, liberating um, human beings. On the other hand, in Kassir's own early philosophy, there's also multiple books that are uh, that engage with Kant's philosophy. They do it at great detail, uh, and this engagement with Kant is um, as being in time clarifies a crucial element of his uh, philosophy because it is a part of his destruction of the history of philosophy, his destruction of the history of philosophy, which is necessary because as uh, being in time opens, uh, we have forgotten uh, being and we have even forgotten the question about being. And so we need to destruct or deconstruct the history of philosophy, specifically uh, Kant's philosophy in order to regain a sense of what being is. The other pillar of that attempt to uh, regain a sensibility of being is, of course, his uh, analytic of Dasein. That's what being in time is mostly about. So there's also this conception of Dasein that goes hand in hand with his, and that runs parallel, actually, uh, with his uh, interpretation of Kant. And these two um, these two lines of thinking, as I said, um, are part of a uh, broader idea of what the task of philosophy is, and it is to revive uh, ontology. And in order to do that, he has to build up an, a theory of Dasein as temporal, uh, as a being that is, that is able to, uh, um, to, to own itself. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to add. Eh? So these are the sources I think that that back that back it up. Eh? If you read the transcript of the Davos debate in itself, then maybe you then I can understand that you don't see a coherent philosophical uh, engagement. Uh, but if you look at all these other sources, and if you look at the importance of these topics discussed in Davos for their own thoughts, then you cannot but but see that they are. With all the flaws that are there, they are debating 
truly philosophical topics that are very dear to them, on which they have a number of touching points, but then um, also on which they need to uh, clearly separate themselves. Um, so that's the one thing I, I, uh, I wanted to add. And then the second thing is that if you look at then the coherence of these three topics, um, then my final uh, thesis is that they are all connected through a shared interest, a shared interest between Kassir and Heidegger, in the human capacity to orient, to orient ourselves uh, in the world and towards the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what the human condition is uh, like for both thinkers, that we as human beings, as symbolic animals or as Dasein, are in our very essence all the time concerned and engaged with orienting ourselves. That's what symbolic imagination does. That's what being in the world also means. But we are also, every now and then, and this is what philosophy especially does, we are also interested and engaged with orienting ourselves towards the world. So we also want to understand how this orientation within the world, our orientation within science, within politics, within religion, within art, how these different orientations can go together. And that's what the philosophy of culture of Kassir wants to understand, yeah? how we can have these different cultural domains that have nothing to do with each other. We can jump from one to the other, and they do together make our world. So how do we orient ourselves towards the world? And that's where Kassir's pluralism comes in. Right? We need to be cultural pluralists. Heidegger is also very much interested in how we orient ourselves towards the world. Right? Um, after describing how we are beings in the world who always already understand the beings, the tools, um, the other human beings around us, he then is interested in how we orient ourselves towards the world. And like, how do we do this orientation? Do we do it by just following the day? Do we, following, do, we do it by following just public opinion about what uh, public opinion says that a dinner party should be? what public opinion prescribes that the kind of human being we should be? Or do we do it in our own or authentic way? Do we do it based on our own uh, potentiality as a Dasein? And it's this tension between orientation within the world and orientation towards the world that I think um, is the crucial topic in order to understand the motivation behind Kassir's entire philosophy of culture, and then also Heidegger's uh, early philosophy. And so, even overarching these three uh, topics, eh, the, the meaning of Kant's thought, the human condition, and the task of philosophy, there is, I think, this motivation to understand uh, how we understand, uh, how we uh, orient ourselves uh, in the world. Well, I'm glad I asked that question because, again, I think it's uh, I, I think what you said is absolutely brilliant and um, and so important again for this contemporary moment that we're all living through. Uh, so let me finish up and ask uh, Simon Truant, what's next? Well, something that um, follows in a way, uh, but doesn't. Uh, uh, doesn't as um, closely uh, rely on, on the history of philosophy. My current uh, research project is on post-truth. Yeah? So the idea that we no longer live in a world in which the truth matters or in which facts matter, uh, but allegedly only emotions and ideology matters. Uh, so this is an idea that... Um, that it's a term that exists for a longer time, since the 90s, but it's a, an, an idea that became very popular after uh, the Brexit and after the election of, uh, of Donald Trump, um, both in 2016. And um, it's for me, it's an overarching topic um, in, in light of many, many topics that are, have become... Uh, very popular both in, in the media, but uh, definitely also within academia. Uh, the topics of fake news, of disinformation, of populism, uh, of uh, polarization. Um, and what I want to do is look at the different 
notions of truth that still play a role in our public debates. So I agree that we no longer seem to have a very clear understanding of what truth is, or at least we no longer seem to have a clear shared understanding of what truth is. Um, there are, um, and and I want to try to well solve that is is really too ambitious, but I I want to try to uh, bring some clarity into that. Uh, by arguing that we do use in our daily lives, but also in public debates, we actually rely on multiple notions of truth. And we have become confused about what the differences are and when to use which one. Right? So there is factual truth, uh, there is ideological truth, there is lift truth, there is pragmatic truth. These are four notions of truth that that are grounded in philosophical theories, in correspondence theory, in a coherence theory, in pragmatism, uh, in phenomenology. Um, but each time what truth means has different criteria. And so I think philosophy can actually help here by, by defending a, pl a truth pluralism, a, a plurality of uh, truth conceptions, uh, can maybe help um, uh, get some... Um, clearer understanding of, of public debates eh? because in a public debate about um, about climate change for example but also about transgender identities there are scientific factual claims that can be made and can be either true or false there are political uh, ideological claims that can be made and that are truthful or untruthful there are lived experiences that can be expressed and that can also be truthful or untruthful um, and it's only by properly distinguishing these ideas of these notions of truth that we'll be able to get somewhere. Because if you look at uh, public debates on social media, one person makes a scientific claim, the next person uh, answers by making a political uh, statement, and the third person uh, responds by sharing um, a lived experience, and the debate doesn't go anywhere, or the debate goes into circles. Um, I think we can only have some productive and also respectful um, public debates if we distinguish these different notions of truth. And I don't know if it's clear, but this is uh, inspired by, by Kassir's pluralism, of course, that for Kassir, you could say uh, there is um, artistic uh, object. He says that there's artistic objectivity, there's scientific objectivity, there's political objectivity, uh, there's religious objectivity. If you translate it to the notion of truth, um, then you can try to uh, come up in a Kassirian fashion, uh, maybe with um, a form of truth pluralism that respects the identity and the criteria of these different kinds of truths, but to tr that tries to um, somehow bring uh, some uh, harmony uh, in between them. And instead of uh, have them fight with each other, try them to be uh, co-constructive. Uh, co well, we'll look forward to getting that as soon as it comes out. Uh, and hopefully we'll have you back and have another conversation. Well, it definitely also involves a lot of rhetoric. So uh, I'm okay. sure you could, uh, you could also uh, teach me a lot about that, that uh, um, from the communication and the rhetorics uh, aspect. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> Again, um, <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, my guest today has been uh, Simon Truant. I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Again, uh, it's it's a terrific book. Um, congratulations on this publication, uh, and again, we'll look forward to that next project when it comes out. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, once again, my guest today has been Simon Truant, the author of Kassir and Heidegger in Davos, The Philosophical Argument, uh, new from Cambridge University Press. My name is Tom DeSena, and you are listening to the New Books Network.